My mom destroyed my family over a vacation home rental she thought she was owed. Me, 38F, and my husband Jake, 40M, have been together for 15 years, married for 12. We have two amazing kids, Timmy, 10M, and Emma, 8F. Jake came from a very wealthy family, while I was raised middle class by my single mother Sandra, 62F, after my dad walked out when I was young. Sandra always resented Jake's family for their money and status. She constantly made snide remarks about them being stuck up snobs whenever the topic came up. I tried to brush it off, as I love Jake and his family had been nothing but welcoming to me over the years. Jake's parents Richard, 68M, and Diane, 65F, were generous to a fault. They helped us with a down payment on our first home, paid for our dream wedding, and set up college funds for both kids. I was forever grateful. About five years ago, Richard and Diane decided to purchase a large vacation home in the mountains for the whole family to enjoy. It was absolutely gorgeous, a huge log cabin on several acres of pristine forest with a private lake. They made it clear that this was a family home, for all of us to use freely whenever we wanted. We went up several times a year to hike, fish, ski, you name it. The kids loved running around in nature. Then, roughly two years ago, Richard was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. It was a devastating blow. Within months, his condition deteriorated rapidly. He had moments of lucidity but was often confused, agitated, and increasingly unable to care for himself. Caring for Richard became Diane's full-time job. She made the heartbreaking decision to move him into an assisted living facility specializing in memory care. It allowed her to still be closely involved while ensuring he received 24-7 professional care. To help fund the tremendously expensive medical costs, Diane decided to rent out the family vacation home when it wasn't in use. She hired a respected local property management company to handle everything. One summer morning, my mother Sandra called me out of the blue. She sounded oddly giddy as she told me, you're never going to believe the deal I got. I rented that fancy cabin your in-laws own for next week, and I only had to pay $500 for the entire seven nights. My stomach immediately dropped. I was speechless. Somehow, my mother had circumvented the property managers and booked the family vacation home behind everyone's back. Mom. You can't just rent that house. It belongs to Jake's family, not some random rental company, I sputtered, trying to make her see reason. Sandra just cackled. Don't be so naive, dear. I saw it posted online for rent, so I booked it fair and square. It's just a house, your rich in-laws need to make money off it however they can to afford taking care of that deadbeat husband of theirs. I was stunned by her callous attitude towards Richard's condition. Deep down. I knew my mother's contempt towards the family's wealth drove this spiteful behavior. I immediately contacted Diane, trying not to panic her but explaining the situation urgently. She was blindsided and mortified. That terrible woman. How could she do something so underhanded? Diane cried over the phone. That home means everything to our family. The memories we've made there over the years, it's priceless. I profusely apologized, feeling awful that my own mother caused her so much unnecessary stress. Diane assured me it wasn't my fault, but she would sort this out immediately. She contacted the property managers, set them straight, and made sure they cancelled my mother's booking. I texted Sandra, telling her not to come to the vacation home as her reservation had been cancelled. I expected an angry response but figured that would be the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. Instead of backing down, my mother flew into an unhinged fury. She bombarded me with endless calls, voicemails, and texts, all filled with vicious insults threats, and equally venomous attacks on Jake's family. You spineless people let those old money snobs walk all over you. I paid good money for that rental, and I'm going. She raged. She showed up at the cabin with an entire van full of her belongings, as if she'd be staying for months. The property managers were there and tried to reason with her, but she just pushed past them and stormed inside. I felt sick as the chaos unfolded. Sandra had completely lost her grip on reality. Something had to be done before this situation derailed even further. Jake and I made the excruciating decision to involve the local police. Two officers arrived and tried negotiating with my deranged mother, but she simply would not back down or listen to reason. I'm not going anywhere. This is my rental, and I have every right to be here. She screamed at them from inside the house. With a heavy heart, the officers declared this an illegal trespassing situation since her reservation had been properly cancelled. They were forced to forcibly remove Sandra from the premises while she kicked, screamed, and hurled obscenities at them. As the police dragged my hysterical mother to the squad car, 
She turned to me with a face twisted by rage. You're a traitorous bitch, just like the rest of them. You'll regret this. I watched in horror as my own mother was arrested right in front of me, all over a rental home she delusionally thought was hers. I couldn't believe how far she had taken this. At the police station, the officers advised me to pursue a restraining order against Sandra for my family's protection. Clearly, there were some very serious mental health issues at play with her behavior. Through many tears, I filed for an emergency restraining order prohibiting my mother from coming within 500 feet of me, Jake, the kids, or the vacation property. The judge took one look at the police report and granted it immediately. When Sandra was finally released from custody, she had been served with the temporary restraining order papers. Her reaction was chilling. This was far from over in her mind. Over the next few weeks, Sandra waged an unrelenting war against me and Jake's family. She bombarded us with contemptible letters, emails, voicemails, and even hired a plane to fly banners over our homes calling us all sorts of vile names. She took out a full-page ad in the local newspaper that included mine and Jake's home addresses, phone numbers, and workplace info, blatantly attempting to make us targets, all because we stole a rental home from her deranged mind. My own mother's unrestrained hatred and consumption by entitlement caused her to morph into someone I didn't recognize at all. She took things to a whole new level when she opted for a shockingly illegal escalation. One evening, our house alarm started blaring out of nowhere. Jake checked the camera feeds and saw a masked person smashing out every window on our home's ground floor. He quickly called 911 as the intruder moved on to slashing our outdoor furniture, dumping our potted plants, and keying long scratches down the side of both of our cars. It was complete and utter vandalism. The police arrived within minutes and were able to apprehend the masked individual trying to flee the scene. Once the ski mask was removed, it was my own mother Sandra. She had been arrested for felony property destruction and vandalism. In her rage-fueled state, she announced proudly, it's what you deserved for betraying me over that rental house. Sandra's mental break from reality was now complete and indisputable. The judge revoked her bond and remanded her to jail, determining she was a legitimate threat to our family's safety. From her cell, Sandra's harassment only escalated further. She orchestrated a constant bombardment of disturbing and threatening letters, drawings, even used her single phone call to scream maniacally at Jake over his family conspiring to ruin her life. The vacation cabin had become such an obsessive fixation that she was willing to tear apart her own family over it. We decided firm legal action was now the only recourse to regain any semblance of peace. At Sandra's eventual court hearing, the evidence of harassment, vandalism, and her overt threats against us was overwhelming. The prosecution pushed for the maximum sentence allowed, five years in prison. I stood before the court, addressing my mother directly with tears in my eyes. You've become a danger to me, my husband, my children, your own grandchildren. We used to be so close, but I don't even recognize the person you've become. This needs to stop. The judge took one look at Sandra's pattern of unrelenting, vindictive behavior and her refusal to take any accountability for her actions. He showed no leniency, giving her the full five-year sentence. As they led my mother away in handcuffs, she shouted one last chilling remark to me and Jake, you'll be sorry for this. With Sandra behind bars for the next five years, Jake and I could finally start putting this nightmare behind us. We were granted a permanent restraining order against her and could legally cut off all contact until she was released. It was a heavy decision, but one that became necessary for our family's well-being and safety. We didn't take any pleasure or satisfaction from it, just relief that this horrendous chapter fueled by jealousy and entitlement could be closed. I went through all the harassment materials, disturbing drawings, and letters from my mother and had them submitted to the prison as evidence of her mental instability. This resulted in Sandra being placed in psychological counseling during her incarceration. Maybe some enforced help would break through to her. As the dust settled, the emotional toll of Sandra's actions began to sink in. My own mother's obsessive rage and jealousy had driven her to alienate herself from the entire family in the most damaging ways possible. The kids were tremendously confused and hurt not understanding why grandma had gone crazy against us. Jake's parents were equally traumatized, never expecting such cruelty from someone meant to be family. I struggled with waves of anger, sadness, betrayal, my motherly instinct told me to forgive, but the victim within questioned how I could ever trust her again after such viciousness. Intensive family therapy became a necessity to process the pain and rebuild. The once cherished family vacation home sat empty, tainted by Sandra's obsessive depravity over an imagined rental. We could barely bring ourselves to visit anymore. Looking back, 
I realize how my mother's entitlement, envy over wealth, and untreated mental issues calcified over the years into a toxic, all-consuming resentment. When she was finally denied something as material as a vacation rental home, it triggered a complete break from reality. What resulted was a narcissistic, dangerous obsession that destroyed family bonds, traumatized children, and landed her in prison, all over a delusional perceived injustice. It's a chilling reminder that some periods of our lives, however darkly challenging, are better off put behind us permanently. My once loving mother was lost to her own demons and ideations long before any of us realized it. Perhaps with intensive therapy during and after incarceration, she can finally find her way back to reality, and regain some semblance of the caring woman I used to know. Slash, the end. Break story 2. Me, 38F, and my husband, 40M, have been married for 12 years. We have two beautiful children, a son, 10M, and a daughter, 8F. Life was pretty good, or so I thought, until my husband's family entered the picture. My in-laws, particularly my mother-in-law, 65F, have always been a source of contention in our relationship. She's a wealthy and overbearing woman who believes her money entitles her to control every aspect of our lives. From the moment we got married, she tried to dictate how we should raise our children, how we should spend our money, and even how we should decorate our home. Despite my husband's efforts to maintain boundaries, his mother would constantly overstep them. She'd show up unannounced at our house, criticize my parenting skills, and belittle me in front of our children. My husband would try to defend me, but she'd guilt tripped him, claiming that she was just trying to help and that he was ungrateful. Things came to a head a few months ago when my mother-in-law announced that she was planning to move closer to us. She claimed it was so she could be more involved in her grandchildren's lives, but I knew it was just another ploy to control us. One day, while my husband was at work, my mother-in-law showed up at our house uninvited, as usual. She let herself in with a spare key she had made without our knowledge and started snooping around. That's when she stumbled upon my private journal, which I had been using as an outlet to vent about the stress and emotional turmoil she had been causing me. In the journal, I had written about how much I despised her constant meddling and how I wished she would just leave us alone. I had also expressed frustration at my husband's inability to stand up to her more firmly. My mother-in-law, being the vindictive and manipulative person she is, took offense to my words. Instead of respecting my privacy or addressing the issue like an adult, she decided to take matters into her own hands. When my husband came home from work that evening, my mother-in-law was waiting for us. She immediately launched into a tirade, accusing me of being an ungrateful, disrespectful daughter-in-law who was trying to turn her son against her. She then revealed that she had read my journal and proceeded to quote some of the more hurtful passages, twisting my words to make it sound like I was plotting against her. My husband, caught off guard, didn't know how to react. I tried to explain to my husband that the journal was merely a way for me to vent my frustrations and that I never intended for anyone to read it. But my mother-in-law wouldn't let up. She kept berating me, calling me names, and demanding that my husband choose between his disrespectful wife and his loving mother. My husband, bless his heart, tried to remain neutral, but it was clear that his mother's manipulation was starting to take its toll. He suggested that we all take a step back and cool off, but my mother-in-law refused. Instead, she turned her attention to my children, who had been watching the whole thing unfold. She started telling them lies about how I was a terrible mother and that she was going to take them away from me. My son and daughter, already confused and upset, started crying. At that point, I had had enough. I told my mother-in-law to leave our house immediately and never come back. She refused, claiming that she had a right to be there and that she wasn't going anywhere until my husband saw the light. My husband, torn between his loyalty to me and his fear of his mother's wrath, didn't know what to do. He tried to reason with her, but she wouldn't listen. Finally, after hours of arguing and emotional turmoil, my mother-in-law left, but not before threatening to take legal action to gain custody of our children for their own good. I was devastated. I had always known that my mother-in-law was difficult, but I never imagined she would stoop so low as to threaten to take my children away from me. In the days and weeks that followed, my mother-in-law made good on her threat. She hired a high-powered lawyer and filed for emergency custody of our children, claiming that I was an unfit mother and that my husband was too weak to protect them from me. The court proceedings were a nightmare. My mother-in-law's lawyer painted me as an emotionally unstable, vindictive woman who was poisoning her grandchildren against her. They used excerpts from my journal, taken out of context, to make it seem like I was a danger to my own children. To make matters worse, my mother-in-law used her wealth and influence to sway the judge in her favor. 
she hired private investigators to dig up any dirt they could find on me, and she even went so far as to bribe witnesses to testify against me. My husband, caught in the middle, didn't know what to do. He loved his children more than anything, but he also loved me and didn't want to believe that his mother was capable of such cruelty. As the court battle raged on, my mother-in-law's tactics became even more underhanded. She started spreading rumors about me in our community, turning friends and neighbors against me. She even went so far as to hire people to follow me and take pictures of me in compromising situations, which she then used as evidence of my unfitness as a mother. I was at my wit's end. I didn't know how much more I could take. My only solace was the love and support of my husband and children, who never wavered in their belief in me. After months of legal battles and emotional turmoil, the judge finally ruled in our favor. He saw through my mother-in-law's lies and manipulation and declared that she had no grounds to seek custody of our children. The relief I felt was indescribable. I had feared losing my children more than anything, and to have that weight lifted off my shoulders was like being able to breathe again. However, the victory came at a great cost. My mother-in-law's vindictive actions had drained us financially, emotionally, and mentally. We had spent tens of thousands of dollars on legal fees and had endured countless sleepless nights and emotional breakdowns. To make matters worse, my mother-in-law refused to accept the court's decision. She continued to harass us, making threats and trying to turn our lives into a living hell. The emotional aftermath of my mother-in-law's actions was even more devastating. My children, who had been caught in the crossfire, were traumatized. They had witnessed their beloved grandmother turn into a monster willing to do anything to get her way, even if it meant destroying her own family. My son, once a happy and carefree boy, became withdrawn and anxious. My daughter, who had always been a daddy's girl, started to resent her father for not protecting her from her grandmother's wrath. And my husband, bless his heart, was torn between his love for his mother and his loyalty to his wife and children. He felt guilty for not standing up to her sinner and for allowing her to wreak so much havoc on our lives. In the end, we decided to cut all ties with my mother-in-law. It was a difficult decision, but one that was necessary for our family's well-being. We moved to a different state, changed our phone numbers, and did everything we could to start over and leave the nightmare behind us. It's been a long and difficult road to recovery, but we're slowly piecing our lives back together. My children are in therapy, and my husband and I are working on rebuilding the trust and communication that was shattered during the ordeal. As for my mother-in-law, I can only hope that one day she'll realize the damage she's caused and seek forgiveness. But if she doesn't, I've made peace with the fact that she'll never be a part of our lives again.